Hi, welcome to the screencast for 17.2. 17.2, we continue talking about equilibrium, but now we're going to look at ways we can deliberately change the equilibrium. So a French guy named Le Chatier said, if stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the system will shift in the direction that relieves the stress. So what the heck does that mean? Well, first of all, stress is any change in the system that upsets or changes the equilibrium. Like if you are on a treadmill, and if someone speeds up the treadmill, you need to speed up in order to maintain your balance or equilibrium. If somebody slows down the treadmill, you need to slow down your pace. In a tug of war, if another person joins one team, then the other team needs to have someone jump in and help, or everyone needs to adjust and work a little harder to uh, reset the balance or the equilibrium. So with that in mind, um, stresses on a chemical system would be things like changing the concentration of a reactant or product, and that could be an increase or decrease, changing the volume of the container, which is then going to change the pressure, or you could change the pressure, which will change the volume. So two and three go hand in hand. You can't change one without the other. And then changing temperature, which again could either increase or decrease. So each stress is going to cause a number of collisions to change, and again, it could increase or decrease. And it's usually going to change uh, the, uh, the number of collisions on both the reactant and product side of the reactions. So the question is, which one has the greater change? Usually the forward reaction or reverse reaction will speed up as a result of this, and it will shift or move the equilibrium. Now, it is possible with uh, pressure and volume changes that there is no net movement of the equilibrium, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you change the position of the equilibrium, you're going to change the amount of product or yield. Okay, yield is your product and usually what we're interested in. Either increases or decreases. Usually the goal is to increase the product. So oftentimes we're talking about equilibrium changes from the point of view of trying to shift it to the right or increase product. And because the stress will affect the amount of product and reactant both, in the end, KEQ will still come out to be the same. Your equilibrium constant will become the same. It's going to rebalance in a way that the change is equal with product and reactant. So the only time that your equilibrium constant will change is if the stress is temperature, because temperature um, reactions are temperature dependent, and the equilibrium constant is temperature dependent. OK, so let's look at some examples of this. Remember, a change to reaction affects both sides of the reaction. It's all in one container. So putting pressure on, the container puts pressure on both the reactant and product side. Adding heat increases the temperature to both reactants and products. So if the stress creates more collisions on the reactant side than the product side, okay, that means more product will form. Reactant gets used and the equilibrium will shift to the right, or you have a faster forward re reaction. So more product is formed, or we say the forward reaction or product is favored. If the stress creates more collisions on the product side than the reactant side, then more reactant will form, product will get consumed, and the equilibrium will shift to the left and speed up the reverse reaction rate. So more reactant is formed, or the reactant is favored. So let's look at changes in concentration that would increase your product. If you add more of a reactant, you will increase your product. How come? Because it's going to increase the number of reactant particles, which means there'll be more collisions than on the product side. That will make more product and will cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. Or again, we say it favors the products. So this is like having more popcorn seeds in the bag there's more popcorn seeds, the chances of one on popping is greater. The other thing you do is remove a product. That will decrease the number of product particles, so they'll collide less than the reactant product particles. That means reactant particles are now colliding more than the product particles, so product net product will be formed, more product than reactant, and it's going to cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. And I uh, the analogy I could come up with for this is like emptying your trick-or-treat bag. You know, when you're little and you went out, you had a little bag. Mom or dad carried the big pillowcase. And as your trick-or-treat bag got full, you dumped it into the pillowcase so there's more room for candy in your little bag. 
that's kind of what's going on with um, removing product. You just allow space, more space for product to be formed and less likelihood of that product turning back into reactant. So let's look at a couple examples. Which way will the equilibrium shift if hydrogen gas is continuously added to the following reaction? And as we do the triads um, in this screencast, you may want to pause when we get here and just think about it for a minute before you listen to me go through the reasoning and read through the red uh, print here. So if hydrogen gas is continuously being added, I like to draw an arrow to show if something's coming in or out of the reactant and which side it's on. So this means hydrogen's coming in continuously, so I'm adding reactant. So it's going to increase the total number of reactant particles and increase the collisions on the reactant side, which means more product will form. So my equilibrium is going to shift to the right or the product side. Second question says, which chemical could you remove to decompose the maximum amount of water? Well, if I look, water is a reactant. And if I want to decompose water, I'm trying to make more product. So removing whatever I remove, removing a product or reactant, removing a chemical will decrease collisions on whichever side it's removed from and shift the equilibrium in the opposite way. Okay, so removing, I'm just going to um, add a little note here, removing a substance, doesn't matter if it's reacting or product, will decrease collisions on that side of the reaction and shift the equilibrium the opposite way. So water's a reactant, but decompose means to break down. So we want less water. Um, we want to form more product. We want less water and more product. So that means we need fewer collisions on the product side. Sorry about that. We need fewer collisions on the product side to shift the equilibrium to the product side. So we could remove either hydrogen or oxygen or both hydrogen and oxygen if we want to increase the product made. What if you want to decrease the product or increase the reactant for some reason? Well, then we could do the opposite. We could add more product and increase the number of product particles, which will increase the number of collisions on the product side. That will make more reactant and shift the equilibrium to the left. If we remove a reactant, it'll decrease the number of reactant particles, so they'll collide less than the product particles. That will also make more reactant and shift the equilibrium to the left. Looking at changes in volume and pressure, these are a little trickier. Um, change in volume will change pressure. That's Boyle's Law from back in Chapter 13. If the volume decreases, then the pressure will increase. And when that happens, particles on both sides have less room, and less room means more collisions. If the volume increases, pressure will decrease, and particles on both sides will have more room. More room means fewer collisions, more room to spread out, less likely to hit each other. So either a change in volume or pressure is going to increase or decrease collisions. And again, it'll be on both sides of the reaction because this is all in one container. So the equilibrium will change if one side of the reaction is more crowded than the other to start with. And how do we know if it's more crowded? You need to count up the number of moles of gas on each side, because moles of gas are the ones that are affected significantly by a change in pressure or volume. Solids and liquids are already as tightly packed as they're going to be, so changing the volume pressure really isn't going to have much effect on the collisions from the solids and between solids and liquids. It's going to really affect the gases, however. So let's look at an example of how you would apply this. A decrease in volume or an increase in pressure will increase the collisions on both sides, but it'll have a greater increase on the side that's more crowded. So it will shift the equilibrium to the side that's less crowded. The more crowded side will see a greater increase in collisions. Equilibrium will shift to the less crowded side. An increase in volume or decrease in pressure is going to make things less crowded, so it's going to decrease collisions on both sides. But again, we're going to see a bigger decrease in collisions on the more crowded side. So a bigger decrease on the more crowded side means the equilibrium will shift to that more crowded side 
or the one with more moles. So here's the equation to look at. Which way would you expect the equilibrium to shift if the volume is decreased for the following? Well, to come up with my moles, I have to look for my coefficients, and I have to be sure everything's a gas. So assuming there's a one where I don't have a coefficient, I see there's four moles of gas on the reactant side and just two moles of gas on the product side. So if the volume is decreased, the pressure is going to increase. Both sides will get more crowded, but there will be a greater increase in collisions on the reactant side because it's more crowded. That means more product is going to form and the equilibrium is going to shift to the left. Okay, as we look at this example, which way will the equilibrium shift if the volume is increased for the following reaction? So first thing I need to look at is see if everything's a gas, and in this case they are. And then I need to come, count up total number of moles. There's two moles of gas on the reactant side, three moles on the product. So the product side's the more crowded side. If the volume increases, the pressure decreases. So both sides get less crowded, but it will cause a greater decrease in collisions on the more crowded side or the product side. So this means less product is going to collide, less reactant is going to form, and equilibrium shifts to the right. Okay, changes in temperature are a little bit tricky to think about as well, but you have to think about a change in temperature as either adding reactant or adding product. So if heat is absorbed in a reaction, it's endothermic, and you can think of heat as being a reactant. If heat is released and it's exothermic, then think of heat as being a product. So with that in mind, if you have an endothermic reaction, then increasing the temperature is like adding a reactant. So more collisions will occur on the reactant side, more product will form, and the equilibrium will shift right. But if it's an endothermic reaction and you decrease the temperature, that will be like removing a reactant. There'll be a greater decrease in collisions on the reactant side than the product side, and less product will form, and the equilibrium will shift left. Exothermic, then, is just the opposite. Increasing temperature for exothermic is like adding a product, so there'll be a greater increase in collisions on the product side, more reactant will form, and the equilibrium will shift left. But for exothermic, if you decrease the temperature, it'll be like removing a product, so you have fewer collisions on the product side, less reactant will form, and you'll shift your equilibrium to the right or to the product. Now, ironically, most reactions are exothermic, so increasing temperature will speed up the reaction rate, like we learned in Chapter 16, but it'll decrease the amount of product formed. So a lot of times in business and in industry, you have a problem of trying to keep the reaction rate fast, but also keep a lot of product being formed. So temperature makes that a little bit tricky with when it's exothermic. Okay, let's look at a couple examples. In the following reaction, should you increase or decrease the temperature to produce more CH4? Well, delta H is given as a negative, so that means I can think of heat as being a product. If I want more product and heat is a product, then I should remove heat or decrease my temperature to make more product get formed. And my last one says, what will happen to the amount of NO2, so that's a product, if heat is added? Okay, so if I look at this, I see that heat is a reactant. So if I add heat, what should happen to my NO2? My NO2 should increase. Okay, and then it says, what would happen, what color change will occur if the reaction vessel is placed in an ice bath? given that NO2 is reddish-brown and N2O4 is clear. So now, if I put it in ice bath, now I'm removing heat instead of adding heat. If I remove heat, that's like removing a reactant. If I remove a reactant, there'll be fewer collisions on that side. And that means I will have more reactant formed so again, removing heat is coming off the reactant side, and I should see it get lighter in color as more N2O4 is produced.